All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Bob Calloway. I'm a uh, technical marketing engineer, reference architect. Uh, I have a variety of titles at, at NetApp, but, but essentially I'm focused on um, NetApp's integrations with OpenStack, our community participation, and making sure that our customers are having success with uh, you know, joint integrations that we do. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, how do you use a concept within Cinder called volume types to avail uh, differentiated uh, s s levels of service within uh, block storage, uh, the block storage uh, project within OpenStack uh, known to the development community as Cinder. Um, so first we'll uh, quickly go over an agenda. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about why does it, is it of interest to actually differentiate uh, your, what, what you have around block storage within, within a cloud. Uh, give you a little bit of background as into how Cinder works because I think it's it's relevant to understanding the overall flow of how volume types are actually respected in the provisioning process. Um, we'll talk about two unique features um, within volume types. One is called an extra spec. Uh, the second is called a QoS or a quality of service specification. Um, we'll give some examples of what those look like. Um, and then I'll walk you through kind of a workflow of when you provision a volume of a particular type, how does that actually work together with the specifications that you've defined to, to affect the, the outcome that, that you're looking for. And then I'll, I have a recorded uh, demo. Given time, I'll, I'll see what we can get through. But it, essentially, it'll show you kind of how that end-to-end -end flow works, both from a, a view of Horizon as well as uh, from the CLI. And then if there's time, we'll do, we'll do Q&A. So it looks like this isn't working. So why? Why think about availing different types of uh, storage capabilities with, from Cinder? Uh, I think the first thing that's probably fairly obvious to most folks is, you know, workloads are not created equal. I mean, you think about what a web server would need versus what uh, a Hadoop deployment would need versus, uh, you know, a more traditional SAP type workload. I mean, the way that storage is consumed by the application uh, layer is very different. And so a one-size-fits-all approach may be very simple to get started, but when you try to pin the underlying capabilities that you have from a hardware perspective into the application layer, um, oftentimes, uh, you know, differentiation is where you're led. From a service provider perspective, this is uh, relevant as well. You know, think about, you know, they're obviously trying to, to sell product at a particular margin. Anything that they can do to, to make that uh, deployment more efficient um, drives not only uh, greater revenue, but at better margins for them. Um, and as well, if they can show that they have better function that they can align towards, you know, big data workloads, if that's the, kind of their specialization, then, then that's great. And the wonderful thing about Cinder being an abstract blood, uh, block storage layer that sits on top of, um, can sit on top of a variety of different storage uh, platforms, whether it be uh, kind of software-defined storage in the, in the LVM or even the Ceph type of mode, and then you look on the other end of the spectrum where you've got kind of hardened storage appliances. Uh, you know, NetApp is an obvious example that's near and dear to my heart, but you know, there's other companies, EMC and uh, Huawei, Hitachi, IBM, et cetera, that all, all are looking to you know, plug in their capabilities into, uh, into a cloud infrastructure. And so since Cinder sits as an abstract layer up, up, up on top of that, uh, you're able to access that from a user perspective in a consistent manner. So it's not, I have to code to the EMC API for this, and oh, for my big data workload, then I have to do NetApp for that. It's a single uh, API, and this concept of volume types is what allows you to differentiate uh, the underlying service uh, that you have. So what do people typically you know, differentiate on? Um, I touched on performance. That's kind of the first thing that comes to my mind uh, whenever people talk about uh, kind of differentiated services. Um, going back to the kind of the network stack, uh, there was a lot of push in the late 90s, early 2000s around looking at different tiers of network service based on latency or throughput requirements. You know, storage in some senses, not too uh, dissimilar from that. You think about, you know, whether it's media format, is it a spinning dish, d disk, is it a flash drive? Um, you know, what, what are the IOPS limits that you're looking to achieve? Was the underlying storage uh, thin provisioned or thick provisioned? Uh, that has implications uh, from a performance perspective. On the flip side, you know, depending on whether you're looking at like a dev test workload or uh, you know, the canonical SAP uh, kind of mission critical enterprise uh, perspective, 
you know, you may have basic requirements in terms of if it's not mirrored and it's not snapshotted on a 30 minute cadence, then that's fine. But for my near and dear ERP system that may be running on top of OpenStack, I need to make sure that there's backup uh, when I create a volume here. And I know where that's going and how often are the, the snapshots or the backups taken. And then finally, you know, thinking about the, the specifics of an environmental uh, environment, or environmental environment, that's a great phrase. You can tell it's right after lunch, so I'm uh, trying to wake up. I didn't find the coffee, I only found the water when I got into the room. But, um, you know, whether it's a protocol perspective, whether it's iSCSI versus NFS, whether it's, you know, you have this heterogeneous environment, multiple vendors, like I mentioned, you know, all of these things are what, what a service provider might want to differentiate on and, and avail through, through Cinder. And just to give you some context, uh, you know, obviously Amazon is the, the elephant in the, in the market today from a, an IaaS perspective. You look at kind of what they do uh, today. When you go to create a block uh, storage volume through EBS, you get the choice of do I want standard or specify the number of IOPS that I want. And I pay based on that. Uh, standard volume is a flat rate. Provision is a multiple, uh, multiplier based on the amount of IOPS I ask for. You look at uh, rack space, uh, to take another example. They're differentiating based on media, media type. So SATA versus SSD and a flat rate from a price perspective for both. Um, which, I mean, that gives you some flexibility, but when you really think about kind of the core um, workloads that have been running in the enterprise for a long time and, and are looking to perhaps migrate on top of OpenStack, having a differentiation is really key uh, to making sure that you align what you allocate in a self-service fashion to those workloads versus having, having it be a very static, uh, heavy uh, dependence on a storage administrator to come in and do the right thing. It, it just, that doesn't work in a, in a cloud environment. It has to be very dynamic and, uh, and user driven. And so Cinder really, you know, in providing block storage services uh, to end users, um, you know, this is what it was built for. It was uh, originally part of the core Nova project. It was forked out of, out of Nova uh, a few years, uh, I guess two year, a little over two years ago. Um, you know, it's a, it's a core project that, that really is about allowing users to provision a, a volume of a particular size and, and then through a particular type. Um, while it's typically deployed as part of a larger OpenStack deployment, we have seen certain customers actually deploy it as a standalone management tool just for block storage within their infrastructure. If they're kind of consuming OpenStack in a very piecemeal fashion, um, you know, that's, that's certainly a possibility with Cinder, but it's not the, not the norm. And finally, one thing to mention is that Cinder is really the management or the control plane. It's not sitting in the data path. Um, so it's a set of management processes that are making sure that you have block volumes created. Um, and, but once it's kind of, those are created and instantiated, they're con connected to their endpoint with most typically a hypervisor. And Cinder stands out of the way and just kind of periodically will monitor uh, usage and, and can handle administrative commands uh, on that. But it doesn't sit in the data path, so it, it doesn't serve as a bottleneck. So Cinder is really comprised of uh, four kind of core processes that are all interconnected through a messaging bus. Uh, they rely on a SQL database. Uh, this is a fairly common paradigm within the OpenStack uh, ecosystem. I mean, this is similar to how Nova works, Glance works, a uh, handful of other services all have this type of paradigm. Uh, the important things to call out here, um, the, the block in orange is the Cinder scheduler, and, and that's kind of the, the brains, if you may, of Cinder. It decides, based on, a, on an incoming request, where should I uh, actually provision um, the storage to fulfill that request. So it actually takes a look at the multiple, uh, in this picture, green volume processes that each have um, a, a driver uh, that corresponds to that particular backend. And, and the name driver is often kind of frowned upon because it, it connotes in most people's mind being part of a data path uh, thing. If you think of a driver being uh, for a fiber channel card or for a NIC or something like that, it's, it's just a, it's a bit of a misnomer. But essentially, it, it contains all the logic of understanding how to talk to a NetApp box, how to talk to an EMC box, how to interact with Ceph. All of that logic that actually builds into the abstraction layer is, is implemented within the driver. But the scheduler is the one that's kind of looking at the overall state of the system, understanding where, where is there available capacity, where are there are different features that, that users might want to access, and then mapping that to the incoming request so that you know when I get told I want a six gigabyte volume that's mirrored and run, is put on a Ceph backend, if that's what you'd like, then the scheduler is what's gonna go through all of the state and make that determination and say, ah, I should put it on the middle one because that fulfills the requirements. So, uh, 
what is a volume type? Uh, you know, it, it's, to be explicit, it's, it's an abstract collection of criteria that you can use to describe a particular level of service. Um, the key things to think about here are, number one, a cloud administrator defines what a volume type means to, it, to their end users. This is not something that's baked in stone or, or you know, baked into the cinder. You, you have flexibility here to define, uh, to define these volume types uh, relevant to your use cases. But they're, at the end, utilized by your end users, so that, you know, your end tenants that are going in and actually creating volumes, that's where they'll select the individual volume types. So your, your end users are not saying, I want a, a NetApp backend with mirroring, uh, with uh, a 30-minute snapshot, uh, snapshot schedule. Um, they're not doing any of that. They're simply saying, give me a gold, or give me the analytics type of block storage. And that all just simply is, is abstracted away from the end user. Uh, one thing to note is, uh, in most cases, you can actually retype a volume. So if you started with it being bronze and wanted to move it into a gold uh, environment, assuming that that's a, a viable trans, uh, transition from the underlying storage mediums, then you can actually do that retyping after the fact. Um, so you're not kind of locked into a decision in most cases. Now, as I mentioned, you know, these are completely defined by uh, a cloud administrator. The typical, you know, going back to the networking analogy, the typical thought goes to is uh, you know, gold, silver, and bronze. Those are your three tiers. And while you can certainly do that uh, within Cinder, um, uh, you can also go with a more use case driven approach, say archival, analytics, streaming, database, those types of notions. So it doesn't have to be, again, this is really a flexible and uh, uh, you know, very uh, administrator friendly uh, construct within Cinder. So it'll, it's, it's not going to force you into a particular model that may not make sense for, for your use case. And, and I mean, for that matter, um, you can name them cats and dogs and ducks if you want. It, the, the name really has no meaning uh, at the end of the day. It's, it's what are the underlying functions uh, that you want to get at uh, within the storage um, and, and avail them to your users. So how is this all used? Um, so your end user would come along, as I mentioned, they're maybe in Horizon or at the command line and they, they're, they're defining their topology. Maybe they're, they're you know, writing a heat template and they're saying, I have this particular cinder volume that will attach to this instance. Um, but at the end of the day, they're saying, I want a 520 gigabyte silver volume, right? So how does all this work together? So the first thing that happens is the cinder scheduler will go back to the database and say, tell me what silver means, right? So the user specified the type and the size. The scheduler goes and learns, okay, for for this particular setup, um, Silver means they want deduplication from a NetApp controller to be true. And the actual backends are reporting uh, their current state, not just how much available capacity do I have, but also you know, my backend has dedupe turned on. Maybe 30 minutes ago, it wasn't turned on, um, and an administrator came along and turned it on. Um, second, um, you know, you've got uh, mirroring relationships that may be established. They may be, you know, disconnected in the background. So if you wanted to look at the individual driver state and make decisions, that's certainly a possibility. But all that information is really collected from the back ends, collected from the database, and from the user request. And the scheduler then determines, okay, based on all of that information, I should provision that volume, that 520 gigabyte silver volume. That's going to end up in the back end uh, B. Um, so the, the logic of... of uh, of how volume types are applied in the provisioning process is really done by the scheduler. Now, as you can imagine, each of the different uh, vendors that have done integrations with Cinder have, have looked at availing features that are unique to them uh, up into this framework so that, so that their end users can act, get access to it. But there's a set of, there, there's kind of a challenge, right, it, it, this being an open ecosystem, right? We, we uh, when we were looking at this uh, concept uh, in its, uh, very early days, we wanted to kind of have a, a standard set of capabilities that, that individual Cinder drivers would export. So if we could come in agreement to the definition of what dedupe meant across EMC and NetApp and IBM, and, um, and then we could agree on what mirroring meant, and then we could agree on these things, then we'd have the standard extra specs that everyone would use. The problem is, is that everyone has a little bit unique view and object model and abstraction, so it's really hard to get a standard definition for um, a lot of these advanced features um, baked into Cinder. So the approach that was taken was to start with a set of default, default capabilities um, that would kind of be the basic things, and then a vendor could actually go back and advertise specific things, and those specific things are, are what are called extra specs. 
Um, but you can see here on the chart, you know, the, the, basically the name of the back end, the vendor, the driver version, uh, the actual protocol that will be used in the back end. Those are all uh, fairly consistent across the drivers and can be exported and used when you define a volume type. So what, what do extra specs look like? And like I said, these are very vendor specific. This list is not meant to be a exhaustive list of what NetApp can do or any individual vendor can do. Um, but just to give you a, a flavor of what this uh, kind of looks like, um, I brought forth kind of the, Net, the NetApp specific example. So you, we've got here, you know, what's, what's the RAID type underneath, uh, underneath in, the, in the individual storage? Um, is it RAID 4 or is it RAID? Uh, um, data protection, a unique scheme that NetApp has. What's the underlying disk type? Is it a flash drive? Is it a spinning media? If so, is it SATA or is it fiber channel attached? Um, was the underlying volume thin provisioned or thick provisioned? Um, is dedupe flipped on? So it's Booleans and strings that get basically expressed in key value pairs that are hooked into, into a volume type. And, and simply, when you specify what, what does a duck volume type mean to you, it's literally a, you know, just a list of these key value pairs that you uh, that you have. And, and I've got the reference here to the, uh, to the OpenStack uh, documentation page. The config reference guide for each of the vendors typically has a table that where these extra specs are defined um, so that you can figure out, oh, I, I'm using HP storage or I'm using NetApp storage. What are the uh, you know, actual capabilities that I can connect to? Now, there's also a, a concept within uh, Cinder called QoS specs or specifications. And they allow you to define more of the traditional data path framework uh, or requirements that you might have. So think of, um, you know, I want to limit the, the overall IOPS for a particular volume to be at X level. And maybe that's because my storage network is shared um, across multiple tenants and I want to make sure that, you know, network traffic is not, uh, you know, too dominant uh, between a, a gold user and a, and a bronze user. Um, you may want the hypervisor to actually enforce those limits, but the QoS spec concept allows you to actually specify again what are those limits um, and where do you want them enforced. Um, so you have the choice of either doing it at the hypervisor, doing it at the storage subsystem, or you can actually have it done at both if, if that's uh, of interest. So the front end specifications, um, you know, the standard fields that are there today. Um, Currently, that it's, it's only supported with uh, Libvirt and KVM as a hypervisor. And it makes use of a feature called IOTune uh, that was added, uh, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, so it's in most major distributions, it's kind of in the default. I think it's version 0, 0 0.098 uh, of uh, Libvirt. Um, but essentially, it allows you to either limit on throughput or IOPS. Um, so you can specify the overall total of IOPS or if you want to read or write specific things. Um, one of the examples I've got later, you think about an archival workload, maybe I want to allow you to write whatever you want, but reads need to be limited out because it, maybe it's going to tape or something uh, on the back end. For, for the, the, the limits that get defined and enforced at the actual storage subsystem, um, again, this is a vendor specific field. We've got two vendors today, um, HP and SolidFire, that have gone and actually defined specific fields within the QoS spec uh, structure. Uh, got them listed there. Um, NetApp and Huawei actually have define QoS uh, extensions within their Cinder drivers, but they actually go through the extra specs framework. And this is more a nature of, you know, OpenStack projects are living, breathing entities, you know, depending on when you contribute, you know, code in, what frameworks are there when you actually go to contribute. So it's not that these vendors don't have support for quality of service, it's more just that they've chosen a different way to do this, and perhaps over time they'll look to, uh, to move under the kind of the more emerging standard uh, framework that's there. So what do these look like? I've talked about them a lot, but give you some concrete examples. Um, so going to the, again, to this kind of the canonical gold, silver, bronze. Um, taking kind of performance as the uh, reason why I would want to build up, a, a, you know, a differentiated set of uh, services. Um, let's say gold then means I've, I'm running on a flash drive and it's thick provisioned. So basically, re let's remove all performance bottlenecks that we can think of in this particular example and make gold screaming fast. Um, silver, um, I don't really care where it ends up, but I'm going to limit the overall IOPS, uh, perhaps to 500 a second. And just to give you context, um, when you go to Amazon and you ask for a standard EBS volume, they're actually rate limiting your IOPS to about 100 per second. Um, so we take that forward in the bronze example here, and let's say we're going to force that onto LVM, which is using direct attached storage uh, 
and limit the IOPS, again, just like Amazon would do for you uh, at 100. So that's, I mean, that's one way that you could kind of slice this up and define it. Um, going more towards the use case driven example, um, let's say again with archival, this is where I know the back end is mirrored, I know compression is on because it's gonna live for a long time and I wanna limit the amount of read workload that, that occurs through this. Um, you know, and it, it really comes down to what's your use case, what makes sense for Hadoop may not make sense for you know, streaming versus database workloads and this is really more of you know, your storage admin who knows your workload well um, or actually can instantiate and look at the performance characteristics at the back end through a variety of different management tools or, um, you know, and, and actually figure out what are the right mappings uh, for your particular environment. But you know, the, the framework of extra specs and QoS specs allow you to kind of mix and match. And when the scheduler gets uh, you know, a request for archival, it's, it's literally gonna go through the list of capabilities that the individual drivers are, uh, are advertising and do a Boolean match to find where is the common set. Um, so you can really just envision if, an, if a request can't be fulfilled because the requirements are such that um, you know, there's no volume, back end volume that has mirroring compression turned on, then that request for that volume will simply just be rejected and say, sorry, we can't give that to you. Um, so switching over to the demo here, um, just give me one sec while I, uh, while I move over here. So what, what this demo is gonna show is that I've got uh, an all-in-one dev stack VM um, running uh, the latest from the Ice House release, so pretty, pretty current. Um, we're gonna go through, we're gonna create a gold, silver, and bronze uh, volume type. We're then gonna associate particular uh, extra specs and QoS specs with those different uh, volume types. And then we'll go and create volume types of, of each of the respective uh, flavors. And um, one of the flavors I have uh, a particular QoS limit on, and we'll actually go into the logs and see that um, the IO2 parameter that, that uh, KVM uses to enforce the QoS spec was actually set. So, kick this off here. Where is my, uh, there we go. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna log in as an administrator. Um, because you have to be an admin to set up volume types. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll create a gold one, um, we'll then create a silver one, and then we'll create a bronze one. And you'll notice that, uh, I'll pause it right here, you'll notice that I didn't actually define any of the, this, the QoS specs or extra specs at this point. Literally, it's just a create a container with a name. Um, it doesn't have any, any predefined meaning when it comes from, from Cinder. So then we'll then continue, we'll say okay, uh, let me go ahead and create, uh, there's a separate object within Cinder for the QoS uh, uh, specs. So I'll create an object called Silver QoS Specs where I'll limit the overall IOPS to, to 500. Again, pulling from the prior example. Um, in here you can see, um, let's see if the laser pointer will work. So you can see it's chosen a backend uh, consumer uh, type. That backend consumer means, uh, again, that it's the storage subsystem that's expecting to enforce this particular limit. In this case, we're actually gonna switch that to be a front end uh, uh, consumer such that you know, the actual hypervisor will enforce that limit. But you can see here that, again, this, the, uh, the key value pair that I've specified is literally stored as JSON in the database. So it's, it's very straightforward to understand what values are there um, and to edit them. There's not currently support in Horizon for editing QoS specs um, or editing um, extra specs. So that's why I'm showing it by the CLI. It's not just because I'm trying to hack this up, but literally today that's the only way that you can actually do this. Um, there is a review um, that almost made it into Icehouse, which was gonna give GUI support to the extra specs framework. Um, but I think I saw on Friday that it's hopefully gonna go into Juno uh, very soon. So we'll rename the uh, the first thing I created there and create a new bronze one. Um, again, just changing the IOPS limit down to 100 to, to match the example. And then we'll go and we'll actually start setting extra specs. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll say for gold, we want it to be provisioned onto a backend named C.NFS. And CDOT is an acronym for uh, Cluster Data on Tap, which is the operating system that NetApp uses on its uh, um, FAS series. So th if you think kind of the, the normal box that people associate when they think NetApp, that's gonna be running the cluster data on tap operating system. And so the next thing we'll do is we'll set a, a second key um, for the bronze type. Which, 
um, will specify that I want bronze images to be uh, sent to an LVM backend, so a, a, a logical uh, volume manager. So this is running on direct attached storage. Um, so it's going to be created within the virtual machine since this is a dev stack VM. Um, the next thing we need to do is associate the QoS objects that we created um, here in this step. We need to associate them with the uh, IDs for the volume types that, that uh, we got back when we created them originally here. So we'll just issue this associate command. And that's, you can actually have multiple quality of service specs associated with a single volume type. Um, so this, there's just a single associate command and, and uh, dissociate command that's uh, the, the negation of that. Um, so we'll simply just associate those uh, with the volume types as soon as I can click play. So we'll just copy the, the IDs for the, uh, again, the, the QoS spec object and the volume type object. We'll do the same again for the, uh, for the bronze um, back end and the bronze volume type. So the next thing that we'll do is we'll actually go back and look at the current list of extra specs um, that we've defined, as well as the current list of quality service specs. So this is, now that we've set it up, I've given you a pretty simple example here of just forcing volumes to be sent to a particular back end. Um, and this is uh, you know, the IOPS limits that we defined here. So we've got one final thing that we need to do. We need to change the consumer here from back end to front end so that the hypervisor uh, is responsible versus the uh, storage infrastructure. So uh, the next command we'll issue is just to, to change the value. And this, the value there is actually set by a, a key called consumer. Um, so a little, uh, a little quirky there, but uh, that's how it's, how it's done. So we'll, we'll come in and we'll say set consumer equals backend for a particular uh, QoS spec ID. Oh, I messed that up. This is why I'm not doing it live, by the way, because I know I got it right when I did it, uh, did it before. So um, now that we've got both of those set again, um, or we're still doing the second one here, uh, but essentially once we've done and we've set it up everything in the, from a, an administrative point of view, then we're going to qu quickly turn to a tenant view um, and say, well, now, now imagine I'm, I'm somebody else on the team. I'm going to log into Horizon and ask for a VM to be created, and I'll attach it to, a, to an instance. So I'll go to the Volumes tab, and there's no center volumes there today. So I'll come in and I'll say, well, let me create you know, a, a gold volume. I select the volume type from a drop-down list. Actually, let me back that up so you guys can see. So you can see here there's a choice when you go to create a volume. There's this type field. That's what actually links back to the objects that we created. You specify the size here, um, and you just create. And then it goes through that workflow process that I talked about before. Um, currently with Horizon today, um, when you go to boot a new instance, you get several choices as to whether you want to boot that uh, instance from uh, the ephemeral disk or whether you want to boot it uh, from persistent storage as the root disk. So there's some options like uh, boot from image, create new volume, or uh, boot from snapshot, create new volume. And in that case, you're actually creating a cinder volume that serves as the persistent disk. Um, there's no support in Horizon today to actually specify the volume type in the web GUI as part of that. Um, but that's something that uh, um, you know, we've looked at actually going back and contributing that into Horizon. And you, you could envision it really be just another drop-down window that would appear when you, you made those selections. So you know, we go through, say, gold, and I only want a gig for this particular use case. Um, it goes through the creation step. At this point, it's going and it's saying, OK, it's talking to the NetApp controller and saying, create me a one gigabyte volume um, on that particular back end. So we'll just go through, we'll create a silver volume, we'll create a, a, a bronze volume as well. Um, so again, the, the users are not doing anything different except for selecting the type of, of a volume uh, at the end of the operation. So once we've done that, we finally get back that everything's uh, ready to go. So the next thing we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll look to actually attach that volume to an instance. So I fired up an instance ahead of time. You can see it in the drop-down list there. Um, so it's actually going to go off and, uh, and do the logic behind the scenes. In this case, where I attached the bronze image, so it's coming from LVM. LVM is going to export it over iSCSI, so it's talking to the hypervisor, uh, creating the uh, target, and setting up the initiator, and doing all of that so that the hypervisor can talk to this particular image. 
And just to show that the quality of service specifications that um, we had uh, put in, back it up here. The quality of service specs that we had uh, done for bronze, if you remember, there were a limit of 100 IOPS per second. Um, so looking at the Nova logs here, um, you can actually see that there's an XML file that gets created um, and the IOPS limit here is, is specified in this total IOPS sec. So you can see where I actually define it in text on the CLI as an administrator. Now as a user, when I've come in and I've selected a, you know, to attach a bronze node, it's then enforcing the limit at the hypervisor when that attachment occurs. So I think I've got a few minutes left for, uh, for questions if anybody has any, but that's, uh, that's the general concept uh, there. So, you know, volume types uh, give you a very easy way that, that end users can then pick from uh, essentially a, a catalog of services um, that has, they can be differentiated on, on a price basis. If you hook in with uh, a meeting, metering infrastructure or billing infrastructure, uh, the volume type information is sent uh, through, uh, uh, through metadata in Solometer, so it's available uh, for you to actually query uh, in that database. Um, but it really gives you that flexibility that you're not going to get from an Amazon or, or a rack space today. Uh, kind of, so thinking about how do you perhaps leverage this in a private cloud environment or, or even a public cloud environment, uh, it's a pretty attractive uh, extension to Cinder. So I'll pause there. Any, any questions from the, from the crowd? When you say a user can access a particular volume, um, so that is not done in, under the scope of a under the volume type because it's more a description at a generic level across uh, tenant. So it's not going to it doesn't have that scope of a per tenant or even a per user within that project. Um, I think that that enforcement is done in, in a in a different place. Well, you have scoping to individual tenants, so it's not like any volume can be attached by anything in the public cloud. So there is actually checking to make sure that the user who is trying to attach a volume uh, is under the same, same tenant scope and can actually facilitate that communication. But it's not a, under the volume type construct that that's, that that's done. So yeah, we've got somebody here at the mic. Yeah, um, oh, all right. Uh, I had a question about uh, defaults, right? So we're talking about um, enforcing, um, but as far as I know, there's no way to force people to, to use um, a type when they're creating a cinder volume. Mm -hmm. So um, the default is essentially to have none, which could very well still create a volume. Sure. So, I mean, it really comes down to how do you allow users to interact with the cloud if it's simply just exposing Horizon? Yeah, you're right in that today there's nothing that lim limits someone from asking for a one gigabyte volume of no type. Um, however, think, uh, if you think more kind of holistically and say, I define a heat template for this particular workload that gets deployed, then I have a natural space to create that linkage. So perhaps in a very self-service dev test type model, there may not be an, a, an explicit way to do that. Um, but for particular types of workloads where you want to define the topology and policies around that topology, um, this provides you a hook to do that. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any, uh, any other questions? Sure. So the, uh, the extra specs you said were the vendor-specific capabilities? Correct. Um, if those are basically, if what I gathered was correct, if those are simply exposing what the characteristics of the underlying storage is, mm -hmm. then why wouldn't the storage vendor simply pass those variables forward? Pass those variables. Like um, mm -hmm. If I've got my NetApp, if the volumes are being backed by NetApp, sure. and those volumes are Mm -hmm. um, why wouldn't NetApp just pass that variable forward rather than we have to supply it to um, the So net, the NetApp storage actually does avail that it has dedupe enabled on the actual controller. It's an administrator has to create the linkage between gold, silver, bronze, or dog, cat, bird to that. So it's not that you are having to go to your storage and so, so perhaps I'm not answering your question. Are you saying by defining the extra spec to say I want dedupe, are you saying then we sh it, it should go to the controller and flip on a dedupe switch? You want to auto-discovery? Auto auto-discovery to say okay. the volume type, this volume that you've created is deduped, it's mm -hmm. grade five, it's whatever. Sure. Um, and or if there's any QoS that I've got set at the back end, bring that forward mm -hmm. and allow me to go in and then say this defines a goal, but this defines a silver. Um, 
as opposed to having to say, here's a goal. Right. And it's got to be de -duke. It's got to be mm -hmm. um, QoS and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's, it should be a fairly straightforward extension to do that. I mean, if you, if you bring up the scheduler logs and you look at the periodic updates that come in, I mean, it is, the different storage systems are advertising on a periodic basis what they can do. Um, it shouldn't be a far stretch from that to actually pre-populate at least a set of choices of what's available versus having to manually go through and do that. But um, that's not the way it works today. That's something that you know, certainly could be done. Uh, all, the, all the kind of uh, fundamentals are there uh, to enable, enable that. All right, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. How does OpenStack make that happen? Is there any automation there? I mean, yeah, so what, what happens is when you get a retype request, it, it'll say I'm going from bronze to gold, and that means I'm changing a disk type. So at that point, it will go back and consult the scheduler as if almost a new provisioning request were coming in and say, ah, is there space on a, dry, on a system that has SSDs, that has all the properties that, that gold uh, is defined to be? If that's true, then Cinder will actually take care of, of doing that migration on a, on a per driver basis. Um, now, let's say both systems were NetApp backends, um, and if the environmentals were set up correctly, that could be as simply as cloning the file from one directory into another directory, and that could happen instantaneously. If you're going from uh, Ceph onto EMC, there's no way for those two things to just magically know what their formats and everything are, so it'll have to do a copy over the network in order to facilitate that. Um, but that will happen as long as all of the uh, all of the scheduler heuristics are executed, line up, and it is, again, as if you're provisioning a new volume, it's just that the source for that volume is an existing volume, rather than empty, uh, in that sense. So, I think we've got time for one more question, if, uh, if there is one in the, in the crowd. All right, yeah, they're in the back. Uh, so the volume types are only... Uh... You may want to come up to the mic, I don't, oh, I don't know if I can hear you. So the volume types are only set at the creation of the volume, or can, the, can those be set afterwards? And uh, can, can we change the volume type? Yeah, so as I just mentioned, um, when you create a volume, you can say no volume type or an explicit volume type. Um, and then there's a, a retype command. I think it's currently only done in the CLI uh, that allows you to switch the volume type after the fact uh, if you later determine that the contents of this workload really needs to be on a flash drive and it wasn't to, to begin with. And you can use the retype function to achieve that. So, all right, well, with that, um, I, think we're, uh, I think we're out of time, but uh, feel free to catch up with me uh, afterwards, but thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>